My name is Gan, as I was introduced. It's very good to have no earphones, because I'm, I think, uh, only one of the few people who don't speak French. I'm grateful to be standing in front of you today to speak about microfinance per request of my friend Arno Ventura, who's a fellow YGL with the World Economic Forum. And uh, we were in Myanmar in May, and he said, why don't you come to the Positive Economy Forum that we organize here in, in France and give a talk? So I know him for 10 years. Uh, we started our careers at almost the same time. We were both involved in microfinance, and uh, we were both uh, somewhat successful in our own ways. I, was, uh, uh, I made a career in uh, banking in Mongolia in the last 10 years. He made an international career with Planet Finance and Microcred. But, but before talking to about microfinance, I need to introduce you some context, and the context is uh, Mongolia. Um, who has ever been to Mongolia? Okay, one? That's it. Who has uh, two? Who has any uh, plan to go there in the foreseeable future? Well, 20. I hope by the end of the presentation you will want to all come to Mongolia so you have a standing invitation to visit my country. Country, it's not hard to imagine. Imagine the surface of moon and imagine that there are animals and people living there. Um, for uh, Mongolia is known to you by our great warrior leader, Chinggis Khan. Probably everybody heard, heard him, and uh, we have had the, one of the largest or the largest contiguous land empire in the world, bordering with China, uh, with, uh, with uh, France at some point in time. Um, today, the country is the size of three times France, or the size of the entire Western Europe. And the reason you see not many Mongolians uh, in your daily lives is that there are only three million of us, of us living on that territory. So it's a pretty scattered population living in, uh, in the country. The country has experienced enormous changes in the last 20 years. We have once ruled the world. We were ruled by Manchu or Chinese Empire for the last 200 years, and then we were ruled by uh, Soviets in the 20, 20th century, and we gained our freedom in the 1990s at the breakup of the Soviet Union, and we started transitioning. 90s were very difficult, and uh, all of a sudden, the, gr the growth in China, the economic boom that we saw in China in the 90s and the first decade of, to uh, of the 21st century, gave us a chance to grow uh, using our mineral resources. Again, big territory, lots of minerals underground. China consuming everything, producing goods for the consumption in the West, and now producing goods for the consumption in the in China itself. It, of course, changes our uh, lifestyle significantly. You can see that the face of the city of Ulaanbaatar has changed dramatically. This town city didn't exist until 1950, and in the last 10 years, we have uh, high-rise buildings, we have traffic jams, we have all the bad things that the Western civilization uh, or, uh, here has experienced in the 20th century. And we are trying to leapfrog in, in terms of our development. And um, they, 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 uh, it is hard to do because um, the, the country is changing. The country is growing fastest in the world. In 2011, we grew 17% in real terms. And uh, the economy has grown uh, year, uh, up, to, up to date uh, this year around 13%, and we're complaining that we're slowing down, and this is economic crisis hitting us, but 13% is a pretty significant growth, and uh, the scale of the growth can also be shown by the fact that the economy grew 10 times in the first 10 years of this century. So, it has lots of implications for, the, for our country, for our society, uh, the way we interact, the way 
We live, our lifestyle is changing. If Mongolians were nomadic people, now a majority of the people live in the cities. When we started doing microfinance in 1997, the, uh, microfinance, the notion of microfinance held uh, uh, something very beautiful for me. It promised that people could lead dignified life. We thought that access to funding will give people choice to work harder, to do business, to increase their livelihoods through increasing their income, growing their businesses, and maybe breaking out of poverty. And not only that, but becoming successful business people so that they could hire more people and contribute to the economic development of the country and do so in a very responsible fashion. The story of microfinance uh, to me is illustrated best by the tale or the story of the Baron Munchausen, uh, which uh, we used to read when we were kids uh, studying in uh, uh, socialist schools. So there is one tale when one day Baron Munchausen is traveling on the horse, falls into the swamp, he yells for help, but nobody comes to help him, to rescue him. So in the end, he stops yelling for help, he takes himself from this ponytail and pulls himself up with the horse out of the swamp. So this story was very illustrative to me because uh, given the proper environment, the legal environment, uh, access to infrastructure, access to uh, knowledge and uh, information, and access uh, to the markets, the poor people, or so-called poor people, could indeed take opportunity and take the loans from microfinance institutions if they were there and lift themselves out of poverty. Because one lesson we learned in, the, in microfinance or uh, with the, with the donor-driven subsidy-based uh, programs to help alleviate poverty in the late 20th century have shown that maybe it's not a good idea to just hand out cash to poor people. It is much better to give them the tool to lift themselves out of poverty. Because oftentimes, when you try to help the poor person by throwing a rope, you risk strangling that person instead of saving him. Because they get too used to receiving help, and they become... Uh, they cannot uh, sustain the, their livelihoods on their own. So, at that point, I thought, Poverty is a state of mind. So in 1997, uh, when I, while I was still at the central bank, I decided to join a UNDP and USAID-funded program. Uh, we lent our first loans in 1998. We gave $100 loans to 16 women. People said, don't do this because Mongolians cannot be trusted. They cannot be... Uh, they're not creditworthy. They cannot do business. They will never return your money. But after three months, all of the 16 women who received 1,600 loans altogether repaid their loans. So this was the start of the story of Hus Bank in Mongolia. And uh, someone was asking me how to read the bank name. I said, well, it, the first three letters are in Cyrillic. The last four letters are in Latin. Hus Bank, not Zak Bank. But uh, it will symbolize to us a transition from a, a centrally planned socialist economy with a very deep Soviet uh, influence to a, transition, uh, to a, a market economy, transition to a more Western-based, uh, uh, value-based system of uh, capitalism and democracy. And uh, today the bank is uh, not just one bank, but it has, uh, uh, we have a holding company with uh, leasing, insurance, uh, brokerage, investment banking. We have innovated uh, new products into the Mongolian market, such as affordable housing products, such as mobile phone banking, internet banking, credit cards, etc. And uh, the 1,600 loans that we gave in September of 1998 now uh, uh, have grown to 1 billion US dollar commercial bank. And it has grown to, uh, from 16 women that we lent 
15 years ago. Uh, now we have 600,000 clients in the bank. And not only in Mongolia, but we have actually international aspirations to scale our model, to replicate our model in our neighboring countries. We're looking at China, so we have a subsidiary in China, pretty much like uh, Microcred and Arno Ventura. Uh, we have uh, piloted our operations in Central Asia. And uh, uh, so the ambition is there to help share with, by sharing our experience with our, with our neighboring countries to, uh, to help people help themselves. But over time, of course, you know, the questions arise with uh, microfinance, with microcredit. Are we really helping country lift itself out of poverty? When I was starting this lending program, um, so I need to do it manually because this is not really a control I just learned. This is, uh, uh, you know, just the bulb flashes there and then somebody presses the button. This is technological advancement that, that uh, we, I just learned. Um, so there was this guy who I don't agree with all the time, Prof Professor Mohammed Yunus, and he asked this question. Why, what is the root cause of poverty? Are poor people poor because they're poor, uh, because they're it's not, not somebody like us? And he, I think, by asking that question, pointed out that the flaw is in the system. Flaw is in the governance, flaw is with our politicians, uh, flaw is in the legislation, in the environment that creates the poverty. So, of course, it triggered me to think that uh, maybe if I was successful in business, I should go join politics and try to help the poverty. When I was starting, the my program in 97, the poverty was about 30%. By 2010, when I joined politics, the poverty was still at 30%. So there are some questions that uh, were posed by me, you know, uh, you know uh, whether the methodology, the actions that we're undertaking really helped the poor. And the answer was really in going into the government. I was uh, asked to become Vice Minister of Finance. So from micro level, I stepped to a macro level, try to uh, make impact changes on the policy level with my government. Unfortunately, after producing 17% growth uh, in the country, people still did disagree and uh, they didn't vote us in. So my party lost the power, I lost the power. The failure is... Uh, uh, something that I needed to learn. And I think it's a very humbling experience. I think it makes you mature, wiser, but it also makes you stronger. I think either Confucius or Ralph Waldo Emerson said that the, the glory lies not in never failing, but rising up every time you fall. And the reason I say Confucius uh, or Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson is that there's this eternal tension between East in the West. And if you Google this, you'll find that every second quote will say, attribute this quote to our Ralph Waldo Emerson and uh, every other one will point to Confucius. But it's a good statement and uh, it helps us, uh, encourages me, it uh, inspires me to do more and this is the reason I stand in front of you also sharing my experience. Um, the, thing about microfinance that also needs to be asked by uh, people who are interested in it. Is microfinance really something that uh, can help lift the country out of poverty? Microfinance implies that we are all entrepreneurs, that we can take risk, that we can run businesses, that we can sell things and at a profit. Uh, uh, one thing for sure, not everyone in this room is an entrepreneur. Some people want to have steady jobs, do what they like, uh, have some time to go in the morning to work and then finish the work at some point in the evening. Entrepreneurship is not about this. The uh, notion of microfinance that all women in developing countries, all males in developing countries are born to be entrepreneurs 
is at fault. So that's why Hus Bank has taken on a path of development that we have to taken and have grown together with some of our successful clients so that some of the initial clients who were not successful as business people could find steady jobs, well-paid jobs at their home, uh, and also help, help their next generations get better education, get proper health care, so that they can become uh, better business people, better employees, and uh, better citizens of the country. Um, I want to finish off with a, a thought. Microfinance is based on the lending to the poor without collateral. When Muhammad Yunus started, he uh, went to a village and said, OK, can you guarantee each other, each other's loans? So usually the group would have 20 women, and uh, they would know each other because they live in the same village, and uh, they could guarantee each other's loans. So no collateral, but still possible to give credit. The advance of technology has transformed the landscape of microfinance in the sense that we use uh, very uh, sophisticated uh, IT systems. We, uh, as I said, uh, use mobile phone banking, internet banking. We use uh, credit cards, etc. Now, the next challenge is What will social media such as Facebook with friends or the closed communities uh, has to offer to character-based lending? Can our friends on Facebook guarantee and stand up to our character? And I want to leave you with that thought, but I will hint that I'm working on this project which enables us to link social media to provision of microfinance. With 3 million people in Mongolia, 3 million people have telephones and access to internet, and 600,000 of them use Facebook. So this is the challenge for me in the next decade. So thank you all for your attention, and I hope uh, I was able to stir some uh, critical thinking in you. Thank you very much to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.